I pray that all of you had a safe and very thank-filled Thanksgiving. Um, we were able to, uh, we just kind of laid low as a family, but my, uh, my niece got married actually up in Minnesota over the week, and so my daughter, we, she was one of the flower girls, and we went up there and we were able to kind of see some people and do the, the wedding thing, and uh, no reception, but all the party once, is, we're all going to party when this is all over, Amen. Right? Okay, there's going to be a lot of parties. It's going to be like recept- wedding receptions one after another. It's going to be awesome. So hold out hope, good segue um, for all of those things. But I'm excited for this series. Now, I, I do have to tell you, though, even as Pastor Joe and I, as we were talking through this series, as we were writing it, we were kind of thinking it through, um, man, it, it might be heavy. All right, we're going to be hitting on some topics that for many people... I mean, these are sort of the splinters in the faith. You know what I'm saying? It's where it's like, it's not like we don't have faith, but there are things that happen in life that they, that they get in there, you know, and they're just like, man, I, I struggle with that. I mean, I love Jesus. I believe in Jesus, but I struggle with that. And notice that throughout the ministry of Jesus, even his disciples struggled with him. So it's okay to struggle. All right. It's, it's okay to have questions. Right, And maybe we're going to hit on some of these topics as we go, but I don't know if there's any that are a little more hard-hitting, though, than, than healing, and specifically the hope for healing. And, and so as we get into this, we're going to hopefully talk about some of those things, but just I want to kind of lay that on you, all right? So if it starts feeling a little bit heavy, that's okay. You don't have to push away from that, all right? Just kind of let it settle on you. And if you get further questions or you're at home, something strikes you, we are available. Please reach out and let's talk about it. Let's work through this, okay? What you don't want to do with the splinter is just leave it sit for too long, right? That's when things can and kind of get on top of it, okay? So, so if, if something comes up, let's talk about it. But we're going to be in Luke 8, all right, 40 to 56. We're going to be working through these two stories that are, yeah, it's actually one story, and then there's one story in the middle, and Luke liked to write that way of putting these two stories together. And so we're going to be working through this. Now, in Luke 8, the first person we're going to meet here is Jairus. And Jairus is a ruler of the synagogue. And he's coming and falling down at Jesus' fleet. It says imploring of him, begging of him to come and heal his 12-year-old daughter. To be a ruler of the synagogue, you're going to be a little bit older. So for an older gentleman to come and fall at the feet of a 31, 32-year-old, Right? This is, this is telling that, 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 that Jairus, is, he, he's, he's at his wit's end. He doesn't know what to do. It's his 12-year-old daughter. Come on, dads. What would you do for your kids? This is not a time for pride, is it? You're setting that pride aside, and you're going wherever. We'll move mountains. That's what dads do. I remember one time my daughter, she was little. She was maybe three, two and a half, three, I don't know, but kind of around the time when they can run, but they can't really move real well, but she could run. So she just hit the driveway and went. And I mean, things happen like that fast. And I'm doing something over here and I look back and there she goes, shoop, right towards the street. And we live on a busy street. And so I turn and I see a car coming and there's a car apart. I'm like, they're not going to see her. Oh my goodness, I, I jumped, I grabbed my daughter, jumped in the road, and just did this one. Like, I don't know what's going to happen, but that car's going to go through me first, right? That's just what you do as a dad. And here's Jairus, he, his 12-year-old daughter is at home on her deathbed. She is dying, and he, he doesn't know what to do. So he's probably heard some rumors about Jesus. He's probably healed some people, he's heard some things, and it's like, you know what, pride aside, I'm asking this guy. So that, this is our first person. Now normally, now normally a 12-year-old girl at this time would be getting ready to celebrate her bar mitzvah. And this is when the girl's going to become a woman. In the Jewish culture, it was around 12 years old, and it was also met with when they'd have puberty for the first time, things would start changing in the woman's body, 
They'd become a full-fledged member of the Jewish community responsible for their own actions, all right? They'd also be eligible for marriage at this time. Now, I know right now you're like, whoa, 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 12, 12. Well, it was a different time then, all right? They didn't have quite the luxury of modern medicine that we have. So a lot of children died in childbirth and a lot of women died giving birth to children. So when it came to procreating and having children, they didn't mess around with this. I'm not saying she would have been married off like immediately at 12, but the plans would have started. All right, These were arranged marriages at the time. They would have started trying to figure this out. All right, Very different than our culture, I get it. But that was the time. So 12 years old, this was a magical time. This is when they're dreaming, they're anticipating, they're at the starting line. The starting line. And, and yet for Jairus and his 12-year-old, we're, they're hopeless. When they should be celebrating, she's dying. You can sense it, the heaviness of the moment. So so Jesus, after Jairus begs him, come, come, right? Come save my daughter. Jesus is like, okay, let's go. So they're walking now through, through the city, and it says that Jesus is getting crushed. I mean, the popularity of Jesus right now is just through the roof. Everywhere he goes, he's being just swamped with people. So as he's on his way to Jairus' house, he's just getting people are all around him. All right, Jesus is one of the most popular people of the time. I don't know who would walk down Des Moines streets and have people flood around them, but you, you can make that up in your own mind, right? Who would you flock to go see? Jesus was that guy. So as they're walking, right, we're going to meet the second person. And the second person is a woman who has had a discharge of blood for 12 years. Now I'm sure you've heard about what this meant for her life, but in case you haven't, this would have been horrific. She would have been ceremonially unclean for 12 years. She cannot go to the temple. She can't go get blessed. She's outside the realms of the community. You're also going to see that for the 12-year-old, daddy was advocating for her, fighting for her, going to Jesus for her. But this woman, she doesn't have anyone. She's alone, isolated, lonely, 12 years. Notice it says in the text that she had spent all her living on physicians, but she could not be healed by anyone. Now, you... I would not recommend looking into medical practices of that time for this particular illness. But all I got to say is this woman has been through 12 years of hell trying to get better. 12 years of agony and suffering. Not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually. The shame and the guilt, the looks, the people... She has spent the last 12 years hiding. Like Adam and Eve in the garden. Just hiding anywhere because of her shame and guilt and all that's going on. This woman is in a tough spot. Constant state of impurity. Now, why do we point out all of these details? It's not just to be coarse, but you got to kind of sink into the text. Because Luke, Luke is... He is painting a picture. Remember, Luke, Luke was a doctor. So he's kind of painting a picture here of two different daughters, 12 years, bleeding, suffering, agony, and the loss of hope. Two different stories that mirror one another in a way. Two different individuals that need hope. It is, it's really hard to have faith, to keep hope when we face illness in our lives, isn't it? It is really hard. There is nothing more powerful that I've seen that can steal our sense of control 
than disease and illness and pain. Just talking to someone who lives with chronic pain. You might be one. You know how it just drains you. To walk with families as someone in the family battles cancer. It's draining. To talk with moms and dads whose kids are sick. It's gut-wrenching. Right, right now, latest stats I read, I don't know, they're changing, but something like 62 million people contracting COVID. Nearly 1.5 million people have died from this disease. I personally know of six. Sad part is when you talk to people and they still act like this is some made up hoax. Some concoction of the government for control. I'm like, get over yourself. Talk to somebody that has brain cells and they'll tell you that this is real. It's going on. Ignorance is not bliss when it comes to this. It's horrible. I just heard a story this last week of an older couple that both got it. And they, they go to the hospital and they're going to and they're gonna be brought in for care and they said, we don't want to do this. Because they don't want to die alone in a hospital. So they went home. The wife's already passed away and her husband's not far behind. It's happening right now. So thank you for taking precautions and being safe. But as we look at this, it's scary. As I said, ignorance is not bliss. Pretending it's not happening won't make it better. And on top of this is still the countless other diseases and illnesses and things that are happening in the world. Through this entire process, we have all had to face the reality of our own mortality and sadly, many people are not willing to look through that window. They don't want to gaze into the mirror of their own death. They don't want to hear the news that the wages of sin is death, that the world we live in is a world of pain, a world of suffering, a world of illness and agony leading to death. That's where we live. Now, why am I getting all, all up on this one? No, it's not just to be morbid. But it's to, it's to sink us into the, the, the message of Scripture and to realize that our hope, our hope, is not for just more life here on this side of the kingdom. It's so that we could be connected to life for all eternity in Christ. He knows exactly what is going on in this world. And he hates it so much that he would rather die than let you die. See, that's the God we worship and that's the situation we're in and yet you talk to people and it's like they just want more of this world and I'm like, why? We don't want this. I don't want this. Yes, I want my family. Yes, I want love. Yes, I want friendship. Yes, I want, yes, but notice, that's all the eternal stuff. I want all the eternal stuff. But we need hope, real hope. And our faith needs to settle in the real hope, a powerful hope, a living hope. Hope that's greater than death itself. Hope, hope in what Jesus came to usher in, and that is the news of a kingdom, a great kingdom. A kingdom that will never end. A kingdom where he's preparing a place for you. A kingdom where he promised, I'm going to take you to be with me. We need that hope. We need a big hope. 
Because we got big problems. So we need a big hope. Now these two daughters encountered that hope in a very personal, real way. The first daughter was the woman who had the, the discharge of blood. And she comes out of the fringes to touch the fringe. She comes out from hiding to just reach in faith that maybe, just maybe. And she says she touches just the fringe of his garment. And it says immediately her discharge is healed. This is one of the most mysterious interactions that I come across because the way that I picture it in my head, I just can't. Jesus being pressed by people from all around and then it says all of a sudden he just stops. He's like, who touched me? Peter's like, everyone. <laughs> no, 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 no. Somebody touched me. I felt power leave me. Like that he's not in control. Of course he's in control of his own power. Right? It's not like charging your phone, like, you know. But it says he felt power leave him. It's like Jesus is saying, yes, I know that there are hundreds of people brushing up against me, but this was a different kind of touch. This was a touch in faith. This was different. Jesus said, no, 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 someone touched me. I perceive power has gone out from me. And it says, when the woman saw that she was not hidden, it's like, oh my goodness. Like, I, I'm exposed. Like, I'm out in the open. Can you imagine spending 12 years? 12 years. She says she came trembling and she fell before Jesus. She's trumped, she's afraid, like, what did I do? I don't know, I just, I had to do something. And notice what Jesus says. He looks at the woman, and he says, daughter. This is the only time Jesus calls someone daughter. The only time. See, Jesus doesn't just restore us Physically, he restored her spiritually. He restored her dignity. He took her shame and gave her honor, daughter. Meaning, I, I am your father. I will protect you. I will advocate for you. I know you've been alone, but not anymore. See, he restored the relationship with her. And then said, go in shalom, go in peace. We're okay. You're okay. Like God coming to the Garden of Eden and saying, Adam and Eve, where are you? Come out from hiding. I want to restore you. I want to heal you. That's what he's doing with the daughter. Come out, come out from the fringes. Don't be ashamed. Leave behind your life of hiding and come before me and I will restore you, I will heal you and I will pull you up and I will kiss you on the forehead and say, daughter, son, be at peace. Oh, it's so intimate. It's so intimate. And Jesus restores this woman then it says he goes off to the house of Jairus. And it says, while he was speaking, someone from the ruler's house came to him and said, he said, your, your daughter is dead. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. So as this interaction's happening, here comes somebody else. And they're like, she's already dead. Just leave him be. It's over. It's done with. And Jesus turns to them with some powerful words. And he says, do not Fear. Believe. She'll be well. Do not fear. Wait, she already died. What am we afraid of? See, we're afraid that we will die. But once death happens, then what are we afraid of? But Jesus says, do not fear 
even though they said she's already died. It's interesting. This whole interaction that Jesus is about to have with this whole household sheds so much light on the reality of death when it comes to Jesus. He says, do not fear, believe. Then it says he came into the house, but he didn't allow everyone to come with him, just Peter, John, and James, and the father and the mother. Everyone was mourning and weeping. And then he turns to them and he says, do not weep, for she is not dead She's sleeping. This is the same term he used with Lazarus. He's not dead. He's sleeping. See, in Jesus, death is sleeping. This is the language of power. It's the language of control. See, this is Jesus saying, you don't really understand death. You don't get it. I get it. You don't. You're out of your depth when it comes to this. See, we talk about life and we talk about death like we understand. Like we get it. We cling to life and we fear death. We wrestle with it. We have identity crisis. We struggle with who we are. We struggle with life as much as we struggle with death. Jesus came saying, I am life. And Jesus came saying, I have control over death. So when he walks into this house, notice this, one of the funniest moments that they all started laughing at him. They started laughing at him because they knew she was already dead. They were laughing at Jesus. Just picture the scene in your mind. You have a 12-year-old girl who is laying in a bed and her pulse has stopped. And they are mourning and weeping for her death. And here comes a 32-year-old rabbi walking into the room and saying, Whoa, 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 whoa. Why is every what's going on here? Stop weeping. Don't be afraid. She's just sleeping. And they start laughing at him like he's off his rocker. He's lost it. Who is this guy? Can you believe this guy? Oh, if I could have been a fly on the wall when that girl comes walking downstairs. Anybody else? Because it says then, then it says they went into the room and he said, child, get up, arise. It says, and her spirit returned and she got up at once. Now there's a lot going on here. Were the people right? I mean, if, if, if her spirit returned, that means her spirit had left. So from any definition I could come up with, I would say she's pretty dead. And yet notice that Jesus comes in and says, I have complete control of this situation. He has the power to return her spirit inside of her. And then says, get up. You're going to probably want a granola bar. That was a lot to go through. Obviously, it says her parents are amazed. And then he says, don't tell anybody. Jesus often said this during his ministry. But why? Before we go further, I do want to say something quick, though, to those, to those who have suffered with illness or disease and have asked the question, why didn't I receive the healing that they received? 
See, this is a hard text to preach on because both people were healed. I've been in that situation where I've been pleading with God, begging with God, God, come on, come through, come on, we're praying in faith. I think this is a lot of faith. I don't know, but come on. And then it doesn't happen in the way that I want it to happen. So then questions start coming, like maybe I didn't have enough faith. Or maybe God wasn't listening at that time, but I know he was listening, but I don't know, but maybe we didn't pray right, or I don't know. And you get scrambled up. Now, I can't give a direct answer to every single situation because I am not the Lord. But I can speak to the ultimate plan that God has for his sons and daughters. And the ultimate plan that God has is that we will be with him forever in his kingdom. Not that we're going to get 80 to 85 on this earth, have a cushy retirement, and kind of fade off. That, it's not necessarily the plan. The plan of God is that we don't fade. That we don't age out. That we don't lose our mental capacities, our physical capacities, our emotional capacities. The plan of Jesus is that we will be in an eternal state of shalom, peace, emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually, for all time, with him, with all people who call Jesus Christ Lord. That's the plan. That's the plan. See, it says in Revelation... I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death will be no more. No more mourning or crying or pain. For why? For the former things have passed away. We are alive on this earth solely with the mission to spread the news of that hope. That is why we have breath in our lungs. If you are meant for eternity, what's 85 years? 80, 75, 90, 100. It doesn't matter. That's eternity. There's no time. You think too hard, your brain or her, I promise. That's what you're meant for. So why do we have life now? We have life now to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ in his mission. To bring hope to the hopeless, healing to the broken, and the good news of the kingdom of God available to all people as a free gift given by Jesus Christ. This is why we exist That when you were baptized, your old self drowned and your new self was risen to a new life with a new identity and a new purpose and new joys and a new marching orders to follow your Savior wherever he leads you. That's our baptismal calling. See, this is who we are. Jesus, Jesus said, to one of his close friends when Lazarus had died. He's dead in the tomb. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though they die, yet they will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? I ask you a question. Was Lazarus dead? Was he only alive When Jesus called into the tomb and he walked out? See, Jesus raised him from the dead to show them a physical example of the eternal truth. 
that Lazarus had been alive the whole time. He was safe. The one you should grieve in this story is Lazarus. Imagine getting four days in the kingdom of God, then you got to come back. See, it takes faith to have hope in the midst of a trying time. And if right now you might be fearing everything that's going on in the world, my, my counsel is have faith and trust. Jesus is bigger than this. He is bigger than this and he loves you and he has empowered you and he is with you and his Holy Spirit is in you. He's in your homes. He's with your family. He's with your kids. Trust him. Talk to him. Pour it out before him. Be like Jairus and just fall down begging him. Whatever you got to do. But if you're fearful right now, then hear those words of Jesus. Do not fear. Just believe. Believe. Maybe you have a loved one who is sick or you're sick yourself. My counsel is keep praying for healing. Beg him for healing. I'm telling you right now, if that was my 12-year-old on that bed, I am begging Jesus to heal her. With everything in me, I'm begging Jesus, heal her, heal her. And that is awesome and don't stop. Don't stop. It's never wrong to pour out your heart to God. Ask Him for what you want. But never, never lose sight of the reality that for every single person who believes in Jesus, they will be healed. That when Jesus rose from the grave, it was an amen to all healing once and for all. Whether it's on this side of the kingdom or in the kingdom of God, you will be healed of all pain, all suffering, all agony, all disease. Death will be no more. Every tear wiped from an eye. That is where you will be for all eternity. And I don't know when that time comes that we pass through the thin veil of this reality into the next, but it is thin. But healing is yours when Jesus rose. You were given the gift of a great big hope. And that hope is found in Jesus Christ. Brothers, sisters, if you've lost a loved one, if you have lost a loved one, know that Jesus Christ is greater than death itself. And that your loved one is at peace in the presence of Jesus. So my prayer is that we will all live out 1 Peter 3.15. I'm going to leave you with this scripture verse. 1 Peter 3.15. Peter says this, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always be prepared to witness to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Do it with gentleness and respect. May you be encouraged in your faith and may you find every opportunity you can to witness to the greatest hope we've ever been given. And that is the grace and love and power of Jesus Christ. Amen.